All right. This video is a review of Julia Gellif's book, The Scout Mindset. I just finished reading the book. I really enjoyed it. And I have written a text review of it for my blog. Before I publish it, I thought I would uh, go through it with you and make maybe some final changes to it after recording this. So let's begin. Recent books in popular psychology, and particularly those about our capacity for judgment and reasoning, don't paint a flattering picture of our intellectual capacities. They argue, these books, that we deceive ourselves that when it comes to knowing something, we feel satisfied, we become satisfied with a feeling of knowing rather than knowing that we instrumentalize our capacity for reason, that even if we have this capacity uh, called rationality and reason, even if we have that capacity, we use it to justify and serve our uh, pre-existing wants and preferences. And what we want is in itself decided by reason. That we conform unthinkingly to established norms and group opinions. So these are all reasons uh, against uh, the belief, any belief that we have the capacity for rationality, that we are rational beings, primarily. These arguments, it goes without saying, have motives and consequences. So they're motivated, they come from kind of motivation, and they also have consequences. And I tend to think that both of those, especially the consequences, deserve our ongoing examination. What kind of examination? We could ask, for example, do we feel more inclined to pay attention to and take responsibility for our thinking and decision-making after we read a book about the subject, like a popular psychology book about thinking? After we read it, what kind of attitude do we have? What kind of attitude comes through once we are done with the book? Are we charged with an attitude of, why bother? Or with an attitude of, okay, let's get to work. Now that I have these insights with me, let's get to work and try to improve our thinking. And do we pay attention to our own thinking or do we focus on other people, those people who are incapable of thinking or on humanity as a whole? And what about our perception of the boundary between the experts and the lay people? What happens to that boundary as a consequence of these popular psychology books? Does the boundary, the, the expert laity boundary, does that boundary become thicker and more difficult to cross as a consequence of the popular treatments of human psychology? Is it the reader that is elevated by the book or is it the pedestal on which the experts stand? Do the experts want to elevate themselves or elevate also with them the, the readers? So these are, I think, important questions. My thinking about these questions and the fact that I care about these questions is closely tied to why I liked Julia Galef's book, The Scout Mindset. The full title of the book is The Scout Mindset, Why Some People See Things Clearly and Others Don't. Reading this book, I believe, would encourage us to take responsibility over our thinking process. It would encourage us to pay attention to our own thinking, to, towards self-examination, as opposed to a kind of passive and unproductive pessimism directed at those people. So thinking about the unthinking masses of people or those other people with their incorrigible biases who happen to disagree with us on political issues. And in doing so, in encouraging the self-examination -exam and a more active role, in doing so, Galef's book subverts the boundary between the rational experts who are equipped to write books about our irrationality and the laity who are informed about themselves, thanks to the experts. The book's and the approach that I am criticizing responds to the limits of human rationality by reinforcing the dichotomy between experts and non-experts. Galef's approach is superior and preferable, in my opinion, because she does not reinforce that tendency, that dichotomy between experts on the pedestal and the lay people uh, at the lower plane, plane of existence. It is not that Galef has found a whole new set of material for her book. Much of her material can be found in other books about human rationality and human irrationality. It is that, so it's not about the material. It is that she treats the material through a different lens, with a different attitude, an attitude that is responsible, practically minded, or solution-oriented, 
and it is hopeful. Given that we are changing constantly, we are changing constantly, that our minds are in constant motion, we could ask, why not, to some limited degree, why not, why not take charge of this constant and inescapable change, this constant and inescapable motion, movement, navigation? Galef gives us a kind of compass by introducing the distinction between the soldier mindset and the scout mindset. By personifying this distinction, by introducing them in terms of types of persons, she has made the compass more effective and more readable. So the, that is the distinction at the heart of the book, the distinction between two types of, these are ideal types uh, that we can imagine as types of people. She calls them uh, the soldier mindset or the soldier and the scout. What is the difference between the scout and the soldier? To give a brief answer, their difference is in their commitments, their, their primary commitments. Soldiers are committed to their side, their positions, what they are arguing for. They, they can get defensive uh, or they can go on the, the offensive. They can get defensive or offensive. Uh, they can win or lose. Scouts, by contrast, are not committed to a side, but to finding out the truth, to finding answers to their questions, to finding acceptable justifications for any given position. The scout, therefore, would try to see the reasoning behind and the appeal for. The, the scout is interested in seeing justification and the appeal, why a position is appealing uh, for both sides of an issue or multiple sides of an issue. Rather than asking, is it true? Is it true is the question that the scout mindset asks. The scout is driven by the question, is it true? It's a commitment to that question. Rather than asking, is it true, in the style of the scout mindset, the soldier asks two different questions, depending on her preference. She asks, can I believe it? When, when considering an idea that she prefers to accept. So when it comes to uh, things that, the soldier wants to believe in, wants to accept, the question becomes, can I believe this? And asking, can I, gives your imagination license to search widely, yet selectively, for reasons to accept the idea. So when you ask, can I believe this, you, your imagination widely searches for any evidence, any reason, any backing for accepting that position. On the other hand, the soldier asks, must I believe it when an idea she prefers to, uh, with an idea she prefers to reject? Asking must I gives your imagination license to search widely yet selectively for reasons to reject the idea. An important consequence of adopting the scout mindset is for the person's identity or self-image. The scout tries to keep their arguments and their self-image separate from each other. The scout doesn't identify with positions in the same way that the soldier does. I am pro-choice. I am an atheist. I am a science advocate, etc. So these are things that the scout tries to avoid. The soldier, uh, these soldier statements, link the speaker's identity to one side of the debate, such that, as a consequence, defending that side turns into self-defense. It turns into a defense of yourself and your group. And the whole thing turns into a process of winning and losing rather than a search for the truth. One of my favorite chapters of the book, chapter 14, is titled, Hold Your Identity Lightly. In this chapter, Galef encourages us to see why we can be more effective, more flexible, and more truthful in our reasoning if we don't carry a heavy baggage of identity-related commitments. In our recent reading group discussion, so I have a reading group discussion that you can join. Uh, in our recent uh, discussion, we connected Carl Jung's treatment of persona. So Carl Jung doesn't just introduce persona. He also criticizes various uses of persona, various ways of falling into the bad faith use of uh, persona. So we connected Carl Jung's treatment of persona to the commonly used type of qualification that... Uh, begin statements. So some statements begin with this kind of qualification that introduce your persona, 
before your statement, including, uh, for example, as a scientist, blah, blah, blah. As a mother, blah, 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 blah. As a Christian, blah, 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 blah. So these are qualifications that introduce you as a type, and then whatever your statement is, is presented within that frame. These statements can deprive the speaker of their individuality and their individual responsibility over the current activity of thinking. So there's a current activity of thinking that is going on. You can be more or less responsible for that activity. And by going behind your persona, you are kind of attributing the responsibility to your persona, to your type, to your group, to your uh, group identity. <clears throat> so these statements deprive the speaker of their individuality in favor of the group type and persona with which they identify. The persona is an achievement of a collective, and as such, our reliance on it, our reliance on the persona, can be an escape from the present reality into the past, into the past achievements of the society. It doesn't mean that a persona is bad. It doesn't mean that archetypes are not useful. It just means that they are not, they are because they are achievements of the past, they are achievements of the collective, they are not necessarily in touch with what is going on right now for the individual at this moment. All right, so I would recommend Julia Galef's book to anyone who is interested in a balanced, engaging, and hopeful treatment of human rationality. It is hopeful because it enlarges our view rather than restricting it. It is a treatment that doesn't just elevate the experts that she reviews and she credits, but we, the readers, are also elevated in the process of going through this book. In my mind, this book is uh, kind of, it reminded me of what Rutger Bregman's book does, The, the Hopeful History, Humankind, The Hopeful History. Uh, Galef's book is similar in that way because it carries, uh, it, it proposes a rational, very rational, very rigorous, carefully thought out position that is at the same time hopeful. If you're convinced of the importance of Galef's project and would like to go further after reading her book, I would recommend the following three books. The first is The Conflict of Mind by my friend and conversation partner O.G. Rose. Uh, second, Reason and Rationality um, and anything else really by Jan Elster, but Reason and Rationality is a relatively short book. And uh, third and last, Respect for Thought, Jan Smetzland's Legacy for Psychology. This is the, the, the longest book among the three and the most technical one, but it's really great. It's a collection of chapters edited by uh, Tobias Lindstad and colleagues. If you'd like to support my YouTube channel uh, and or join our reading group, please visit my Patreon page. Otherwise, thank you very much for your attention and until next time.